chapter 3, verse 18 through chapter 4, verse 5. If you have your Bibles with you, please follow along. If not, you can follow along on the screen beside me. Receive now God's word. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> there are two things that lead to divisions in the church. The first is when you elevate human wisdom above God's wisdom. And the second is when you elevate human leaders above God himself. And as we've been seeing in the last couple of months, these were the underlying issues of the quarreling and the divisions in Corinth. The members of this church had imbibed the wisdom of the culture that surrounded them, their values, their definition of success, the goals that they were pursuing, their understanding of status. All of those things were thoroughly determined by the standards of the world. So not surprisingly, there was a hostile spirit of competition as they tried to establish themselves as the more superior when they saw their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in positions of power. They were filled with jealousy, and that jealousy spilled over into strife. This is part of what fueled the factions as they rallied around prominent figures in the church such as Paul and Apollos and Peter They sought to arrogate to themselves greater status by virtue of association. This betrayed the fact that they had a faulty understanding of these leaders in the first place. They were busy making judgments, not just about the apostles, but about all the other leaders in their church. I'm going to follow Paul because he's the founder. I'm going to follow Apollos because he's eloquent. I'm going to follow Peter because he's the chief apostle. They enjoyed playing this game of comparing and complimenting and condescending one another. And the criteria that they employed in these evaluations was, again, based upon the wisdom of the world. So the Corinthians elevated human wisdom, and they elevated human leaders, and the result was catastrophic. This is what Paul has been addressing, really, since the beginning of this letter, And today we come to a passage in which he summarizes all of the previous discussion once more. You can think of today's sermon as a review sermon, which as it turns out is quite appropriate considering that there's a lot of you back from school and you haven't been with us the last couple of months. Paul touches upon many of the themes that we've already looked at before giving a final rebuke at the end of chapter 4 and then moving on to a new topic at the beginning of chapter 5. To be exact, there are four issues within the Corinthian church that Paul addresses, or I should say readdresses. These will be our four points. Issue number one, the Corinthians had adopted a very worldly wisdom. Issue number two, they had formed competitive and divisive factions. Issue number three, they had an idolatrous view of their leaders. And last but not least, issue number four, the Corinthians were very quick to make judgments of one another. To put that more simply, number one, the issue of wisdom, two, the issue of factions, three, the issue of leaders, and four, the issue of 
judgment. Again, this is a summary passage. So much of this will be review for most of you at least. I have preached at least one full sermon on each of those individual topics. But review is good, and review is often necessary, especially if it is in the text itself. And so let's pray one more time, and then we will begin. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your word now to once again incline our hearts to what you have to speak to us. And so we ask that you would open our eyes as we prayed so that we may be, we may be able to see the truth in this text and not just to understand it, but to apply it and live by it. Father, we bow before this word so that we might become more sanctified and so that we might become better representatives of Jesus Christ, a more holy church that is more fitting of our holy God. And so help us, we pray. We we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's the first issue in Corinth, the issue of wisdom, verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. We have here yet another paradox of the Christian faith. If you want to be wise, you have to become a fool. This principle is not unique to Paul. Jesus himself taught something similar, for example, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 49, where he said, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Or Mark chapter 10, verse 31, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. Paul summarizes his discussion on wisdom with two imperatives. One, don't deceive yourself, and two, become a fool. That's not as clear in English, in the English, but if you take a look at the Greek, you will see that Paul has written those two verbs in the imperative form. So these are commands that he expects you to obey. The Corinthians had deceived themselves into thinking that they were wise. Paul uses that word twice each time he's referring to something else, and so lest you get confused, in the first instance he clarifies They thought themselves to be wise in this age. That phrase indicates that he's talking about the wisdom of the world. This age not only refers to this historical period in contrast to the age to come, but it also refers to this entire fallen order that has rejected God. As we saw especially in the first two chapters, The world looks upon the revelation of God in his son Jesus Christ. It looks upon the cross and it judges it to be foolish. So as Paul said in chapter 2, none of the rulers of this age understood this, this as in the wisdom of God. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would not have crucified Jesus who is God. For Paul... This is characteristic of the world, not just 2,000 years ago when Christ was actually and historically crucified, but in every age. God reveals himself and God reveals his purposes for man supremely in the word incarnate in Jesus himself, but also in the word inscribed in the Bible. So that the world's ongoing rejection of God's word can be understood as a continuation of their rejection of Jesus Christ. Now, just to be clear, we're not talking about wisdom, for example, as it relates to business or medicine or politics, at least not directly. Paul's not suggesting that you have to reject the world's way of practicing medicine, that you shouldn't go to secular hospitals. To be wise in this context is primarily related to one thing, Namely, knowing God. And that may seem to be an extremely abstract topic at first, but when you think about this, you'll see that there's nothing that has greater practical implications upon your life. Because the question of who God is determines basically all other important questions in life. Such as, what is the meaning of life? Who is man? How ought man to live? What defines morality? What makes man happy? What is sin? How can man be saved? And so on and so forth. All of that begins with God. When it comes to answering those questions, 
when it comes to being wise. It is typical of the world to reject God's revelation, God's self-disclosure, and instead to depend upon itself. And now here's the second imperative. If you think you're wise, then become a fool. I love how that's a command, by the way, become a fool. Here's a reminder to us all that this is not optional. If you're a Christian, being foolish in the world's eyes is a must. And don't miss the implications that this command would have had for the Corinthians. Another way of saying become a fool is embrace the cross. That's the positive version of that command. Embrace the cross. In Corinth, the cross, the fairly recent news of a poor Jewish rabbi who had claimed to be the Savior but was crucified by the Romans, that cross was total garbage. And anyone who was willing to throw away his life for that faith was a borderline lunatic. And so when Paul says, let him become a fool, he's saying, if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you have to be willing to commit social suicide. You have to be willing to let go of your position and status in society. Of course, for the believer, we're not becoming fools for the sake of becoming fools. It's not as though we're supposed to enjoy being the laughing stock of society. We're becoming fools that we may become wise. This is true wisdom. If you want to know what it means to be wise, here it is. When you consider yourself foolish, when you consider the world's wisdom foolish, and therefore you submit to the revelation of God in Christ Jesus, you submit to this book not just to give you certain answers, but you submit to this book in the way that you choose to live. That's what it means to be wise. Now let me just point out in verse 18. It is very clear, in fact you can't get clearer than this, that the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God are opposed to each other. You cannot hold on to both at the same time. If you want to be wise according to the world or according to yourself, you cannot be wise according to God. They are mutually exclusive. That may seem self-evident to you, but trust me, for many people it is not. This is one of my pet peeves. I'm going to go on a little rant here. It is related, but it's kind of a rant. One of the things that really bothers me is when I'm having a conversation with someone about Christianity or about God, and they do this very thing. They try to hold on to both their own wisdom and the wisdom of God. For me, these people are the worst. They're more frustrating than talking with someone who straight up denies God's wisdom, who denies the faith, because at least then there's something to talk about. But maybe you've heard someone say something like this as well. You're talking, talking, talking about God, Jesus, the Bible. And then they say very politely, it's always very politely, they say, I agree with everything you're saying. I like Jesus. I think he taught a lot of really good values. I believe in God and I consider myself a Christian. But, and this is the part that really annoys me, they go on to say, but I just can't bring myself to accept X, Y, and Z. I'm not going to go as far as saying that the Bible is perfect. I'm not going to go as far as saying that it's right on everything. In fact, I think it contains mistakes. I think Paul was wrong on certain issues like women's role in the church. I think he was culturally blinded. And those more fanatical topics that are brought up, like the creation account or the virgin birth, it's all just a bit too much for me. I can't accept it. And when I hear comments like that, well, first of all, it just kills the conversation for me at least, but second, it actually confuses me because I want to know what's going on in that person's mind, that person's heart, because I think to myself, how can such a flimsy foundation Support the beliefs of any real person, of anyone who's even marginally honest and marginally thoughtful. And doesn't he recognize that he's undermining the basis of his own faith, and that in turn makes me think, does he even believe in the faith? And if he doesn't believe, then why not just say it? And it drives me crazy like this, but then I keep a straight face, and I try to end the conversation as quickly as possible. 
This is more common than you think. They hold reservations about God's wisdom. They think they can straddle the fence. A little bit of my wisdom and a little bit of God's wisdom. And in all seriousness now, maybe you are actually in a similar camp. You might not be as extreme, but perhaps there are certain aspects of God's word that you think are silly, and so you choose to reject. Not the whole Bible, but parts of it. And if that's the case, you have to listen to Paul. Don't deceive yourself. You are not being wise. See, let me explain to you what that kind of person is doing. He is basically picking and choosing what to believe and what to apply. But let me ask you this question. When he does that, what is his criteria for embracing this part of the Bible, but not that part of the Bible? What's his criteria? Well, whatever it is, it's not based on God's wisdom. It's based on his own wisdom. That is not someone who has submitted to God's word. That is someone who has submitted God's word to himself. And if he agrees with any portion of scripture, such as the moral values that the Bible espouses, that's simply because it happens to overlap with his preferences. Most of human civilization agrees with the moral values of the Bible, but that doesn't make them all Christian. Don't deceive yourself if you think yourself wise, then become a fool. Let me tell you, there is nothing that makes you more into a fool than this. When you tell the average person in America that you believe in everything that this book has to say, that you believe that it was divinely inspired, and therefore that it is the rule of your life, that makes you foolish according to the world. It always has. But Paul says, become a fool so that you may become wise. Moving on to verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Perhaps you caught this, but Paul is here backing up his instructions by being an example after commanding the Corinthians to become fools, to relinquish their own wisdom, he then goes on to quote two passages from the Old Testament. And you see why that's significant. He's showing them that the basis of his commands isn't himself. It's actually God's word. His judgment that the wisdom of the world is folly isn't simply his opinion. It's what God has said. The first quotation comes from Job chapter 5, verse 13. He catches the wise in their craftiness. For those of you who are familiar with the book of Job, that verse actually appears as part of Eliphaz's speech. Job suffers all this loss, and then his friends come and start offering him advice, offering him wisdom. But at the end of the book, God appears and rebukes all of Job's friends. So you have to appreciate what Paul has done here. This is an ironic quotation. Eliphaz is an example of someone who spoke better than he knew. He says the right thing, but then he applies it in the wrong way. He's an example of someone who is wise in his own eyes. And at the end of Job, Eliphaz's words come true of himself. God catches him in his own craftiness and exposes him to be a fool. And that fits perfectly, doesn't it? into the context of our passage. If it's perfectly in the context of who Paul is addressing. The second quotation comes from Psalm 94.11. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Now if you actually look up Psalm 94.11, you will see that it says, the Lord knows the thoughts of man. It actually doesn't say, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. And it's funny because a lot of scholars point to this and say Paul misquoted the Old Testament. Paul made a mistake. 
But if you pay attention to the context of the psalm, then you'll see why Paul has made this change. In Psalm chapter 94, verse 8, so just three verses before the verse that he quotes, the Psalter says, Understand, O dullest of the people, fools, when will you be wise? So within his context, who are the men that the Psalter has in view? It's the previously mentioned fools. And so Paul takes that verse, he changes the word man to the wise, because in Paul's passage, the wise are referring to the fools. Paul doesn't just quote two Old Testament passages, but in the way that he quotes it, he displays a commanding knowledge of those texts. See, he doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the walk. He is a man who places weight upon God's word. He studies it, he applies it, he appeals to it. He lives and breathes according to the scriptures. That was the first issue in Corinth, the issue of wisdom. Now for point number two, the issue of factions. Verse 21. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Verse 21 spells out the natural implication of the previous discussion. If indeed the wisdom of this world is folly, if even the most gifted and brilliant men are incapable of peering into the mysteries of God, then naturally to boast in men would be really, really dumb. This is a direct shot at the Corinthian factions. That's what they were in fact doing, boasting in different men, asserting that their man was better than the others. Grammatically speaking, the preposition in, that's a dative of reference or respect. So to boast in men means to boast or to glory with respect to or with reference to your relationship with that person. We talked about this as well, didn't we? In Corinth, who you knew and who you were seen with meant everything in terms of your status, your worth, your identity in society. So those who boasted by saying, I follow Paul, they were glorying in Paul's persona. They were hoping to have his fame and his power rub off on them. Same applied for all of these factions. Paul offers this corrective. Since man's wisdom is foolish, it doesn't make much sense to boast in men. But now for his reasoning, for his reasoning, Paul offers a surprise twist. The reason why you should not boast in men, whether Paul, Apollos, or Peter, is because all things are yours. You don't have to pick and choose, he says. You don't have to limit yourself to just one of us. You can have all of us. This is related to the way that Paul understands Christian leaders. They are servants of Christ and servants of the church. So rather than being served by the church, they've been appointed to serve the church. We'll say more on that in the next point. But here the emphasis falls upon the fact that from one angle, the Corinthians were claiming too little for themselves. Their jealousy and their strife and their desire to promote themselves was creating this tunnel vision that prevented them from benefiting from all that God had gifted them with. And there's an important principle that we can draw out from here. Whenever there is division and conflict amongst different groups within the church, inevitably, What ends up happening is that each group robs itself of part of God's blessings. Is how D.A. Carson puts it. He writes, factionalists ignore the wealth of the heritage we as Christians properly enjoy. Factionalists ignore the wealth of the heritage we as Christians properly enjoy. Now, we have to be careful here. By saying all things are yours, Paul is not suggesting that when you have 
one guy whose theology is really crappy and another guy whose theology is rock solid that you should not show any preference between the two. Now, you definitely should. First of all, I would hope that you can discern that. But second of all, having discerned that, you should want to submit to the leadership and the teaching of the man of God, the one who's devoted to studying and expounding God's word, not to the one who's preaching heresy, not to the one who's lazy, and I would even add, not to the one who's not gifted in teaching. We should note that that is not the situation in Corinth, though. Paul's not talking about good shepherds versus bad shepherds. He's talking about himself, Apollos, and Peter. He's saying, when you have these apostles and teachers who are all godly men, this is presupposed, all godly men, who are all clearly gifted and called by God to this task, you don't have to choose. They're all yours. They've all been provided for your edification. This is kind of what the Corinthians were doing. Imagine if you showed preference to one apostle, say Paul, and therefore you neglected every letter except for the Pauline epistles. How absurd is that? And yet that's what the Corinthians were doing. Factionalists ignore the wealth of the heritage we as Christians properly enjoy. Now, in verse 22, this idea leads Paul kind of on a tangent. It leads him to offer up this doxology. He says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, so he addresses the factions. But then he continues, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Not only does the Christian possess all the ministers of the church universal, but the Christian possesses literally everything. Let me just highlight one of the items on that list. Perhaps this one also caught your attention. Paul says, all are yours, even death. And your initial reaction may be, I don't really want death. I'll take the world, I'll take life, I'll take the present and future, but you can keep the death. But no, even death is yours. And I think this is what Paul is getting at. You see, even death and everything that falls under death, such as sufferings and miseries and pain, even those terrible things, just like the ministers in a church, have been appointed by God to serve the Christian. They are yours in that sense. They've been submitted for your good. And I think this interpretation is confirmed when you compare this passage to Romans chapter 8. There Paul composes a very similar list when he writes in verse 38, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why is it that none of those things, that nothing in creation can separate you from God? Why is that the case? Well, because all of those things, even the bad things, contribute towards your sanctification and they actually prepare you to receive your final glory. That's the point that Paul made earlier in that same chapter and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for our good. So here's how one scholar describes the imagery that Paul is painting with his doxology. It is as if this multitude of servants, they surround us and on bended knees hold out their precious offerings to us. Some of these servants, like pain, injury, sickness, grief, and death, may at first have a strange look to us, but it is God who commissions them all and makes each one bring us some blessing so that as kings unto God, we lack nothing. 
It's a beautiful description, isn't it? It is as if this multitude of servants on bended knees hold out their precious offerings to each one of you. All is yours, Paul says. That's, of course, the case not because we're so great, but because, as Paul writes in verse 23, we are Christ's and Christ is God's. There's no need to get uncomfortable with that last phrase, Christ is God's. Paul is pointing to the relationship between the first and second persons of the Trinity. Christ belongs to God as a son belongs to the Father. And so here's the flow of logic. If we have inherited everything that belongs to the Son, and the Son has inherited everything that belongs to the Father, and the Father rules over the entire universe, then what's the conclusion? All is yours. Everything is now at your service. Not least of all, the apostles themselves. Tying this back to the issue of factions, I hope you can see how senseless it is to to quarrel and to compete with one another within the church. See, people fight each other when they are grasping at something that they feel as though they don't have, when they're jealous. But if you possess everything, what's there to fight about? Nothing. So Paul draws the Corinthians' attention away from the tiny piece of the pie that they're desperately trying to hold on to, and he draws their gaze upwards towards the abundance of the riches that they have in Christ Jesus. So the issue of wisdom, the issue of factions, and now third, the issue of leaders, chapter 4, verse 1. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Having addressed the factions, Paul now addresses how they ought to regard or think of their self-claimed leaders. The Corinthians had elevated them upon this pedestal in the same way that the leading figures in the society of Corinth were elevated above their peers. Paul corrects this worldly evaluation by describing the ministers of the church, including himself, as servants and stewards. Servants and stewards. We're going to have to do a little bit of a word study here because for the third time now, the English doesn't quite capture the meaning of the Greek. First, Paul says we are servants. And that may remind you of what he had said earlier in chapter 3, verse 5, when he said, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed. However, the word that Paul uses there and here is different. In chapter 3, Paul described himself as a diakonos which to remind you refers to someone who waits upon tables, more generally to someone who performs unskilled labor, someone who serves. Here, back in our passage now, when Paul describes himself as a servant, the word he uses is huperites. Originally, that word referred to a galley slave. If you've ever read or seen Les Mis, at one point in the story, the character of Jean Valjean becomes a galley slave. He gets chained up at the bottom of a ship, and all he does day and night is row. Being a galley slave was supposedly one of the most torturous things that a man could physically endure. That's what this word originally meant, huperites. But as time passed, it came to have a broader meaning referring to a subordinate. So what Paul is emphasizing here is the specific characteristic of church leaders as men who are subordinate or bound to someone in a higher rank. So ministers are those whose task is to serve, diakonos. They are those who are subordinate, huperites. And thirdly, they are stewards. The word there is oikonomos. The word oikos means house, nomos means law, and so oikonomos, if you were to translate that woodenly, would mean someone who keeps or manages the law of the house. I think you can tell that although all these words overlap in meaning, each term also highlights something unique. Oikonomos highlights the fact that church ministers are men who are responsible 
or held accountable for something very specific. They're men who've been charged to manage a specific object. And what is that object? Well, it says it right there, stewards of the mysteries of God. I wish I could see inside your brains right now to see how you're processing that phrase, the mysteries of God. Hopefully that's ringing a bell for most of you at least because we went over this at great length in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. There Paul had said, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. And as I pointed out for you when we were going over that, the word that Paul actually uses there is mystery. We impart a mysterious and hidden wisdom. The mysteries of God, to put it concisely, refers to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The emphasis being placed upon the cross as the designated means of salvation. So ministers are those who've been appointed to steward the gospel. Then in verse 2, Paul continues to expand upon this metaphor. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Faithfulness is a key requirement of the minister. Some of your translations have trustworthy. I know that there are a handful of people here who are aspiring to be ministers in the church, and so listen carefully because this is especially relevant for you. The imagery that Paul has in mind is that of a household manager. The master has appointed his servant to be in charge of his entire estate. He tells the servant, I have to go on a business trip, and I'm going to be away for a couple weeks, maybe even a couple months, who knows. And then he says, make sure you take care of my household. And then the master leaves. A steward, I'm talking about actual stewards back in the day, a steward was responsible for managing not just the house, but the land, the harvest, the income, the taxes, the other servants, and everything and anything else that belonged to his employer. A good steward was a faithful steward. And here's what that means. That's not talking about faith as in belief or saving faith. That's talking about the character of trustworthiness, reliability, dependability. To be faithful means when your master is away, you manage all of his property. You work just as hard and just as honestly as if he's right there. That's what it means to be faithful. That is not a low bar in terms of character. In fact, there are not that many people who work that way. The world looks for eloquence, intelligence, the charismatic personality. That's certainly what the Corinthians were looking for in their leaders. But God looks for this. Are you faithful? Will you work just as hard when he's away as if he's standing over your shoulder? And to state the obvious, God is always right next to you. Now let me say something to everyone. This is the primary responsibility that God has placed upon each one of us. This is what ministry boils down to, plain and simple. God has entrusted you with this mystery, the gospel message, and it's now your task to proclaim it. Not your opinions, not your personal preoccupations, not your own wisdom, but God's wisdom, and to proclaim it as if Christ, as if your master is coming back today. That's ministry. This is the same imagery that Jesus employs in Matthew chapter 24. In a context in which he's teaching his disciples about his second coming, Jesus says in Matthew 24 verse 45, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household? So once again, Jesus is employing the, the imagery of stewardship. Who's the faithful and wise servant? Blessed is that servant 
whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Who is the faithful and wise servant? It's the one who's doing what he's supposed to be doing when the master comes. Chapter 4, verse 3. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. The last issue that Paul addresses in our passage is the issue of judgment. The Corinthians were very quick to evaluate and to critique one another. The converse was also true. They cared a lot about the evaluations that others made about them. This was another aspect of the Corinthian culture that had seeped into their church. Not only did your social network determine your status, but closely correlated to that, what people said about you carried a lot of weight. This was a culture of commendation and praise and flattery. I want you to notice that there are three judicial courts that Paul brings into the discussion. There's the human court, there's the court of conscience, and then there's God's court. In regards to the first, Paul says, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. You should know that that literally says human day. It is a small thing that I should be judged by any human day. The word day has been translated as court to bring out this idea of judgment, but it does mask the fact that Paul is deliberately contrasting this human day with the day of the Lord. The Corinthians lived with the human day in view. Paul lives with the day of the Lord in view. And this verse may sound a little bit dismissive, perhaps even arrogant, as though Paul is saying, I don't care what you guys think about me because I'm an apostle. I'm above you guys. But within this context, that's clearly not what he's saying. The point is, human judgment is fallible. It's prone to error. It's limited. It cannot take into account all the data of the human heart, nor the full span of man's life. And ultimately, it doesn't decide the verdict. Men won't be the ones to distribute punishments and rewards. And so with that in mind, Paul is saying, your evaluations of me, whether negative or positive, they're completely meaningless. He's not insulting them. He's wanting them to adopt this perspective. We know that he's not insulting them because he goes right on to say, in fact, I don't even judge myself. Not only does your judgment not count for anything, my judgment also counts for nothing. As I described a moment ago, Paul's talking here about his conscience. The human conscience acts as a constant judge against oneself. What you have to recognize, however, is that your judgments are just as prone to error as anyone else's. How can that be, you say? Don't I know myself way more than the next guy? Sure you do, but the problem is you also like yourself way more than the next guy. You're biased. One theologian defines the conscience as it is used in the Bible, he defines the conscience like this. He says, It is the painful reaction of man's nature against infringements of its created limits. And then he goes on to compare the conscience to the pointers on a dial. The hands on a clock may accurately keep time, but if the clock is set incorrectly, then not only is that clock useless, it is actually deceptive. It's not helpful. So the painful reactions, our sense of remorse or guilt that results from when we infringe upon our own internal standards, that cannot be absolute, since it's not always dependable. Not even the Apostle Paul's conscience And he was an apostle who knew scriptures extremely well. Not even his conscience is absolute. I'm not aware of anything against myself, he says, but I am not thereby 
acquitted. There is only one court that counts, and there is only one court that is perfectly dependable, and that is the court of Christ. It is the Lord who judges me, and now in verse 5, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Only God can do this. Only God can bring to light the things now hidden, your motivations, your wishes, your desires, the purposes of your heart. All of that, will be taken into consideration on the day of the Lord. You know, we may not live in Corinth, but I think we can relate to this issue of judging. We are far too easily impacted by the opinions of others. We seek after the praise of men. We even quarrel and compete in order to receive that praise. In my observation, this whole self-centered enterprise, often it ignites when we hear people praising someone we don't particularly like. It's in those moments that we start getting jealous. It's in those moments that we're tempted to slander. It's in those moments that we create division. Maybe not official factions, but divisions. Well, by way of application, let me just close by reading for you a section from Calvin's commentary on this very passage. Calvin writes, The day is properly given to that time when darkness and obscurity are scattered and truth is brought to light. Therefore, the apostle declares that it cannot always be concealed who have undertaken the Lord's work under false pretenses or who have carried out their duties faithfully. It is as if Paul said, darkness will not always prevail. At last, the light will shine out and will show everything. Paul suggests in this way that the true servants of God are not always precisely distinguished from false workers because good and bad points are covered by the cloak of night, yet that night will not last forever. For ambition is blind. The favor of men is is blind. The applause of the world is blind. But God will dispel this darkness when he returns. I don't know about you, but I found that to be both convicting and encouraging. On the one hand, there's a clear warning here, especially if you're hiding something. What's hidden to men is not hidden to God. And that can be a scary thought, but hopefully it's a fear that leads you to repentance. On the other hand, there's encouragement as well, perhaps especially for those of you who suffered injustice, whether you feel as though your faithfulness is not recognized or someone who wronged you wasn't adequately punished and so you're tempted to slander You're tempted to pursue revenge, to judge. You have to learn to just let it go. You have to learn to find comfort in what Calvin says. Darkness will not prevail. And so as you trust in God's coming judgment, you let that injustice fill your heart with a greater sense of expectation so that you can say sincerely from the depths of your heart, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for this word that you've given us. We thank you for this letter of 1 Corinthians, and we thank you for this church, this historical church in Corinth, We even thank you for the many issues and problems that they wrestled with. For as Paul inscribed this letter and addressed those issues, it becomes a lamp unto our feet. It exposes our sins and our problems so that we can correct them and so that we can become more holy and more sanctified unto you. 
I ask that you would continue to help this congregation to reflect upon this mirror. Help them to identify areas in which they fall short in manners similar to the Corinthian church. And may the power of your word, may the power of the words that Paul wrote through your Holy Spirit, may that word convict us and may it empower us to repent and cling to Jesus Christ as our only source of righteousness. We pray all these things in his strong name. Amen.